Good morning, students. Um, it's Sunday morning, and I thought I would go ahead and get in my uh, video for today uh, as I continue uh, the Odyssey. Uh, by now, you know, if in fact, I've gotten responses from several of you. I have uh, given you an email uh, outlining all of the grades that uh, we've done in terms of the semester, that is, thus far. And uh, most of you, many of you, I should say, <clears throat> are taking your course quite seriously. You're putting forth a good effort, and I think you're showing an improvement. Now, I know we were told, or you've been told, that we're going to maintain a kind of leniency in terms of this semester. Uh, I, I likely agree, but I cannot be fair to you if you don't do your part. And I think that uh, that you're reasonable young adults, and you know this yourselves. If you don't submit the required work, then there's not a great deal of, shall I say, courtesy that I can show you. So once again, those of you who are lagging behind, you're going to have to put forth a kind of effort. Now, seriously, if you're overwhelmed by what has happened, there's nothing wrong with, and you remember I told you that they've extended the drop date to May the 1st. If you feel that you can't make a satisfactory grade in the course, then there's nothing wrong with, with dropping it. Uh, uh, so what if on your transcript, there appears uh, a cue. That doesn't matter. You really want to, if you can, salvage the course, but you don't want to, you know, fail and have that on your record. So as you're finding out in my teaching, the Odyssey, part of it, of what Odysseus is having to learn is to exercise choice. And you've got to do that uh, as well. Now, what my plan is, I'm going to de deliver this video uh, this morning, and then I will finish likely tomorrow. Uh, that will be my last one. Uh, and then I will have taught, under the circumstances, the Odyssey, meaning as well as I could. And again, I remind you, <laughs> these are certainly trying times for you, but also they're very trying times for us as faculty. I sort of think sometimes you might get the idea that, you know, it's thrust just upon you. It's thrust upon all of us, and we're trying to make the best of this situation. Um, what I plan for you to do in the course of this week, uh, I'm not going to give any more <clears throat> of these reading assignments. I've asked that you read the Odyssey. I've given you some deadlines that I have not necessarily imposed upon you. I've given you two uh, reading assignments, and I've told you to go ahead and finish the Odyssey. You have in the course of the, this week to do so, but at the same time, I want to let you know that we have one more work remaining in order to finish the semester. And so I think in the course of this week, you would want to go ahead and start your last work, which will be in your anthology, or if you want to buy uh, order a paperback or go online, you can get a copy of Shakespeare's play, Hamlet. That will be the last work I will teach uh, for, the C, uh, for the semester. Now, we will have a major exam over the Odyssey, and that exam is going to come a week from tomorrow. And by the time I finish uh, my lecture tomorrow or Tuesday over the Odyssey, I'll review again with you the format, but right now uh, the exam will be, you're, we're not going to use Blackboard, we will use email, and then you're going to do a formal Word document to submit. I tried this with my Shakespeare class, and that worked very, very satisfactorily. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, probably over the weekend, I'll send the copy of the exam to you and it's going to be due a week from tomorrow, and you will have until midnight to get it <clears throat> uh, submitted to me. Uh, that's a week from Monday, but I'll say a bit more about it tomorrow. So 
uh, what I want to do now is, you remember I had told you I would pick up in book 10, and I will finish, uh, we're beginning the uh, episode with Circe. So my line of reference is about line 135. Uh, Odysseus and his men have, have just encountered uh, the, uh, I'll say, I guess it is a kind of adventure with what's called the uh, Lestragonians, the giants. They have suffered casualties, losses. So as you begin, it says, we traveled on with heavy hearts, grieving for the loss of our dear friends, though rejoicing at our own escape. Now, what I want to call your attention to here is you will have the third episode outlining, if you will, an, an utopian experience. He will now see Circe. And remember, all of this is going to be told in uh, flashback. So uh, Circe is important. Now, once again, he will establish a kind of relationship with her. You remember, his men are going to be eager to leave. Odysseus is not going to be quite as eager to leave as perhaps he had in other adventures, meaning in the utopian experience. Uh, Circe, their relationship, uh, <clears throat> they've established, I think, a, a fairly good relationship. Also, probably there's been a kind of physical moment uh, between the two. Now, what Circe represents is what I call a kind of secret uh, knowledge. And once the two of them are able to cut through a great deal of what I call a kind of phony behavior in terms of their relationship. Now, she, is, she does offer a kind of temptation to him. And the difference, shall we say, between Circe and Calypso, Circe, ha Circe has the power to enchant. Notice, for example, what she's going to do to the men of Odysseus. Remember that she turns them into swine. All right. Now, <clears throat> once they can cut through, shall we say, this nonsense, and this is part of what we find, in, uh, I think, in human relationships. You remember, you've got to cut through all of the peripheral and then finally come to the basis of what, con what I think uh, constitutes a meaningful relationship. Remember, you don't have to any longer put on airs. You know, when you first meet somebody, you want to make a good impression, that sort of thing, and you're going to try your hardest and uh, so forth. Well, this is sort of true what you find in terms of Circe. See, one of the things that you don't want, Odysseus doesn't want to happen is at a given time uh, for her to turn him perhaps into uh, a swine. They don't want to, uh, he doesn't want a kind of phony behavior with her and she realizes that herself. Now, the important thing about Circe, she's going to teach Odysseus, I think, a really very important lesson here. And the lesson has to do with, he's got to understand the importance of, he's already mastered the art of deception. Remember, we've talked about the whole business of the Trojan horse. But in terms of Circe, what he's going to learn from Circe is the importance of useful deceit, useful deception. See, once again, all of this forms a kind of progression. And so when he will be fit to go back to Ithaca, uh, you remember that he will exercise a kind of deception. Now she's going to give him a very important piece of advice, uh, and this is a, going to allow Odysseus to undergo a kind of moment of symbolic re, uh, rebirth. See, he's got to cut off, throw off all of these illusions about being the epic hero. I've already prepared you for the, for the idea that when Odysseus comes back home to Ithaca, he's not going to be that traditional epic hero. The gods have another, if you will, function for him. 
So as you go into the adventure section, I would call your attention to about line 325. That's line 325. I hope you're not totally distracted. My clocks are going off uh, since I guess for all purposes, it's now high noon. So if you look about line 325, notice uh, Cersei is uh, asking the question, who are you and where did you come from, she asked. And her words had wings. Uh, where is your native town? Who are your parents? All right, read into that passage. Now, <clears throat> go to about line 335 and look what Odysseus says. Circe, I answered her, how can you order me to be gentle with you? You who have turned my friends into pigs here in your house, and now you have me too in your clutches. See, that's my business of showing you this idea that he says, I don't want any more pretense. What they've got to do, and, and we've got to do this in terms of relationships, they've got to establish a kind of bond of trust. And <clears throat> they're going to then be able to do so. Uh, you're going to see very shortly that she's going to keep her word, and uh, she will do something that some say they're surprised that she will do. Now, if you go to about line um, 0360, it reads with the shining bronze uh, vessel, or when the shining bronze vessel was boiling, she set me down in a bath and washed me with water from the great cauldron. My bath done, she rubbed me with olive oil, clothed me in a tunic and a splendid cloak. See? Once again, I call your attention to the importance of the uh, I write that he has to participate in, which you've read a number of times now, this idea of bath. Bath represents a kind of acceptance, a kind of stability. Now about line 390, Cersei keeps her word. Stick in hand, Cersei went out of the hall, threw open the pigsty, and drove, drove them out, uh, looking exactly like uh, uh, full-grown uh, swine. And then you can finish uh, reading in terms of that passage. Now, um, Odysseus is going to have to uh, make probably one of the most important journeys of his life. And here's this idea that I had said earlier, that she's going to actually give him, if you will, useful advice. So, I call your attention now to about line 485. Now notice what she says here. She says, before you can get back home, or even hope to get back home, you're going to have to make another very important journey. This journey is going to be a, a, a transformation, if you will, for Odysseus. Uh, this journey is going to allow him to gain knowledge that he had not had before. So she says, heaven-born son of Laertes. Now remember, Laertes is his father, uh, who is the king of Ithaca. Resourceful Odysseus, do not stay on unwillingly. Now look, remember I like Calypso? She says, look. If you want to go, go ahead and go. See, she's not going to bribe him. She's not going to offer him all of these, shall we? In other words, she's not giving him the gift of immortality. She's simply saying, uh, if you wish to go, once again, I, impo uh, I want to impress upon you the importance of choice. But first, you have to make another journey and find your way to the halls of Hades and dread Persephone to consult the soul of Tiresias, the blind Theban, uh, Theban prophet. That's important now. You remember we talked when I had first begun the course, I said that uh, in terms of the Greek notion, uh, once man dies, his soul goes to hell. All right. And Persephone is the wife. Remember, she's the wife of Hades. So what this amounts to 
is that Odysseus is going to make a journey, but this journey will be a journey within itself. Within the larger framework of the adventures, it's a journey. But once he gets to Hades, and it's going to take a bit of time, there is this idea of that journey within the larger frame, uh, if you will. Now, this will be, I think for all purposes, his rite of passage. Now, remember, contrast this moment to what you read in terms of the Iliad. You remember I said that uh, in the Iliad, hell comes to Achilles. Um, Odysseus goes to hell, and he's one of few who've been afforded, shall I say, this opportunity. Odysseus gets to go to hell and view hell before he dies. Some misread and say by the time he gets to hell, uh, he's, he's not. Just think, he gets this opportunity to go to hell and there he will get to visit the souls of those who, are, uh, who have departed. All right, a very important, if you will, fixture. <clears throat> so now I'm ready to go, <clears throat> excuse me, into chapter 11, uh, which is entitled appropriately, The Book of the Dead. Now, I think an important point that I should make to you here is uh, very much he's wanting to gain knowledge, but also what must happen here is once he goes to hell, it, it, he's getting a kind of what I call crash course uh, in the theory of death. It's like, for example, uh, if they still offer it here, and I think that you do, there's a course that you can take. Uh, I think it's either in sociology or perhaps psychology, one of the two, and it simply is entitled Death and Dying. All right, Odysseus is going to learn about the theory of death. In other words, the gods say before you get to go home, you need to know about death. So it's as though he's going to get a book, so as to speak, hypothetically, and he's going to read about death, and then he's going to say, okay, I read about death, I know death. The gods are smart. And this is what will become the purpose of, of chapter 12. He thinks he knows about death. The gods say, we're going to test you. All right, now, one of the things that he must do is my reference to you now is about line 35. He's got to show a kind of respect. And it reads, when I'd finished my prayers and invocations to the community of the dead, I took the sheep and cut their throats. See, that's part of the ritual uh, that I told you, part of the ceremony. And you remember as you move down to about line 50, it says the first spirit that came up was that of my own comrade, Elpenor. Uh, for he had not yet been buried in the wide bosom of earth. All right, so the notion here is, and you remember what <laughs> happened, he did not die, help him nor a kind of heroic death. So that's part of this business of the ritual. All right, now, what's to happen? And my reference now will be about line 80. Uh, he's learning. He, see, his part in this adventure is he is the dominant force here. He is the, once again, in an episode, he's the significant character. However, this moment changes a little bit from previous uh, adventures. Now, all, all you need to go is to think about uh, his stay with the Cyclops. You remember how he was controlling and significant there. He's more humble now. In other words, his function now is to be somewhat quiet and observe what happens. So I always like to explain it this way, that when Odysseus goes to the 
uh, to Hades. He's more of an observer rather than a direct participant. Now, in order to not sound clumsy with you, very much he's there and he's participating, but he's not that much of an active participant. All right, now, I'm, my reference to you will be about line 85. It says, now these, the souls begin to appear, and it says, next came the soul of my dear mother, Anticlea, the daughter and, and so forth. Look, my eyes filled with uh, tears when I saw her there. Now just remember, he's been gone for 20 years. In that lapse of time, significant things have happened. His mother has died while he was gone. You can relate this most well in terms of the human situation and the human condition today. And I was stirred to compassion. Yet, deeply moved though I was, I would not allow her to approach the blood first before I had questioned Tiresias. Now, part of it, remember he was warned by Circe, you need to go and talk to Tiresias. All right, now, go to about line 100, and as you read information here, look at what uh, Tiresias tells him. One of the bits of information is learn Odysseus before you can get back home. You need to learn the art of self-indulgence. Remember, he gives them a warning about uh, don't bother the cattle belonging to the sun god. All right. And then also, I'm at the bottom of, uh, in my text, about line 120 for you. Uh, he warns Odysseus about what Odysseus is going to face once he gets back home to Ithaca. See, so it says, but when you have killed these suitors in your palace by stratagem or in a straight fight with the naked sword, you must set out once more. In other words, we won't be concerned here. He says, when all of this is over, after a period of time, you're going to go on another uh, adventure. Now, how about this information about line 135? Look what he finds out. He says, as for your own death, as, excuse me, as for your own end, death will come to you far away from the sea. A gentle death. When he takes you, you will die peacefully of old age, surrounded by a prosperous people. This is a truth that I have told you. See? Now, quite different from some of these heroes that we're about to meet. You remember, for example, shortly he's going to be able to see Achilles. Remember, uh, I gave you in terms of one of the videos, one of my lectures, the background, and I told you very clearly what has happened to uh, Achilles. Now, how about going to about line 210? Uh, now there's an opportunity for him to see his mother. It reads, Mother, I cried with words that wing their way uh, to her. Why do you not wait for me? I long to reach you so that even in hell we may throw our loving arms round each other and draw, draw cold comfort from our tears. Or is this a mere phantom that Persephone has sent me to increase my grief. Now, part of this is he must experience what I want to explain as the consequence, the realization of death. All right. Now, look what she says. See, part of it, his mother is dead and he needs closure. This is, you know, what we participate today in certain rights. Think in terms of the few, of, of the idea of a funeral. The funeral provides a closure for us to accept what has happened. Therefore, in other words, it becomes, if you will, a kind of finished story. Now, 
The next part, beginning about line 230. Some say this is most confusing. Actually, it's not going to be that confusing. Uh, Homer, you remember in the Iliad, I called your attention to the epic device of itemizing and cataloging. You say you're going to find the same thing here. I'm, I'm going to read just, and you don't need all of these names, but I just want to make my point. About line 230, he observes and it reads, the first I saw was highborn uh, Tyro. Read on down and it says, and when the God had made love to her and so forth, you can read that. And, and it says, the next I saw, and then about line 270, it says, then I saw Jesus' mother. And then it says, next came the great, you don't need all of these names. I'm making a point here. Homer is trying to instill in you a kind of cultural awareness of what's going on in terms of the Odyssey. He is, I told you that the Iliad for all purposes was a poem of war. This poem, if you will, is a poem of peace. The emphasis is that on the domestic. So some have criticized Homer and have said, well, he did nothing uh, in showing uh, women in terms of the Iliad. Well, I explained to you that in the Iliad, mostly it was about war. <coughs> in the Odyssey, it's different. Look at the compliment that he is going to pay to women. This is part of that aspect of his cultural past. What he's doing is, in terms of itemizing and cataloging, he's moving from mother to mother. <coughs> and these mothers are of these heroes. So I think it's very much, if you will, an important compliment uh, to women. Now, part of what's going to happen, there will be a break. Uh, there's going to be a kind of intermission, and that's going to be very important. But I would like for you to go now, skip over, and go to about line 440. And let's look at some of the, uh, shall we say, unsung heroes, we might say, in terms of the Odyssey. Think about it now. Look what he's, uh, whom he sees now. About line 440, he sees Agamemnon. And notice the advice that Agamemnon gives him. Never be too trustful, even, on your, of, uh, even of your own wife, nor show her all that is in your mind. Reveal a little of your plans to her, but keep the rest to yourself. Remember, I told you for all purposes that probably Agamemnon is a bit biased. But Odysseus is going to pay attention. But notice that when he comes back home, he doesn't immediately reveal his identity to his wife. So he listens to Agamemnon. Now, the great moment for me comes about line 475 when he sees Achilles. Look at this moment. Hero meets hero. All right? Now, uh, <laughs> this is going to be a very important moment because what's going to happen here is that Odysseus is going to be reminded when he sees Achilles that all of Odysseus's wanderings have not been a distraction. Some would say, Oh, these have been a kind of waste of time. They haven't been. Now, look at the moment between the two. Uh, Odysseus says about line 475 or so, Achilles, I answered him, son of Peleus, far the strongest of the Achaeans. All right, and read into it, and it says, but you, Achilles, are the most fortunate man that ever was or will be and read more, and look what he says. He's trying to uh, offer a kind of compassion, feeling for Achilles. You're great, but now we have to take into account. Achilles is done with life. He's dead. He's in Hades. And look what uh, uh, Odysseus says. Do not grieve at your death, Achilles. 
and then look what's to happen. And do not you make light of death, illustrious Odysseus. I would rather work the soil as a serf on hire to some landless, impoverished peasant than be king of all of these lifeless uh, dead. When I say that he's gaining knowledge, Achilles is saying, you want to trade places? I'd rather be living than to be dead. Remember the choice that Achilles had to make. So don't you see in the book of the dead how Odysseus is learning, if you will, a great deal. He never thought about this. See, he's living. He's got to cherish life and to believe in all aspects of life. Life is important. Now, there's another, I, I think, sobering moment about line 555. Um, I think for all purposes, you're going to find that, see, when I made the statement to you earlier, that really Odysseus here um, is a kind of observer. He listened. All right, I want to point this one out to you. He sees Ajax. Now, you remember I told you in the background that Ajax doesn't like Odysseus. You remember I talked to you about uh, the contest between Ajax and Odysseus over which one would get the armor uh, of Achilles. So what Odysseus is trying to do here is sort of make amends. See, part of what Odysseus has got to do, there, you know, he's made some mistakes, and he, in a sense, has got to uh, atone for some of these mistakes. So he sees Ajax, and about line 560, he's trying to say, no one else is to blame but Zeus. He it was who brought you to your doom. Draw near, my Lord, and hear what I have to say. Curb your anger and conquer your obstinate pride. So Odysseus is saying, come on, I won, let's forget. But this is a great moment, all right? So I spoke. He made no reply, but went away. There, for all his bitterness, he might yet have spoken to me. All right, now, I think this is excellent because I think it's very humbling. Odysseus has got to cope with this moment uh, it's going to be a kind of embarrassing moment for him. And so, look, I think it's very effective that Ajax not just tell him off. See, there are going to be these moments in life in which you're going to try to say, okay, look, I won out and uh, you lost, you know, get with it, go on. And sometimes, you know, it can't be forgotten. So Ajax looks at him, he's still very angry, and I think it's silence is such a good, good treatment here. He looks at him and then just walks away. That's good. Odysseus needs to become a bit humbled. Now, what you're going to find about line in my text about line 580 and so forth, uh, he's going to see some of those true sinners who have gone to uh, hell. One is Tantalus. Now again in the interest of time you read about Tantalus. Tantalus is one who has offended the gods very much. You read that account uh, on your own. <clears throat> again in the interest of time what I want to do is to explain to you the last chapter uh, in terms of the adventures and then tomorrow I will finish the Odyssey as we are Tuesday, whatever day I choose, you'll, I will have finished it in plenty of time for you to prepare for your exam. Uh, so I'm going to talk briefly about chapter 12, and then, as I said, we'll be ready for the third section. All right, what's going to happen here is there are three moments that will occur. Now, I want to set it up this way. I'm in chapter 12, and I disagree 
with these uh, critics who say, all right, he's learned everything that he needs to know about the importance of life and death. The gods say, all right, you've had the opportunity to experience uh, the, uh, death. You've got to observe uh, the souls of those uh, who, who died. Now, we're going to just, as I'm giving you next week, if you say, I understand the Odyssey, I'm saying, all right, prove it. You're going to take a test. So this is what's going to happen in chapter 12. How much has he learned? And in other words, if you've gained this newfound knowledge, prove it. We're going to test you. So one of the things that will happen, uh, and there are three adventures. Uh, one of the, there are three moments that I want to call your attention to. And actually, to save you a little bit of time, I'm not actually going to um, go in and show you different passages and that sort of thing. I'm going to explain to you the significance of these three moments in terms of chapter 12. And each brings the note of death. Now, one thing that happens is that uh, Odysseus is going to have to, in order to get back home, he's got to deal, and say what you want to do in terms of chapter 12, read some of the lines. I, as I said, I, I wanted this to be about 20 minutes, and it's already doubled in time. So if I can explain it to you this way, and then you go back and reread a little bit, I think you can see the essence of what I'm wanting to explain to you. He's got to deal with Sulla and the Caribs. All right, the notion here is, you know what, how each represents death. Well, read there, and what you want to, to do is, you're not going to become paralyzed, if you will, by death. In other words, this is sort of, gosh, I think that this is rather revealing to us today. Look, in a sense, what we're facing. All right. But clearly, the idea is death is inevitable. Death is present. But you can't let it paralyze you from living. But at the same time, you can't be foolhardy either. So that's why I think if you look collectively as one, look at what Scylla does and look at what the Caribs does. See, with, you remember the whirlwind? You can't be so stupid as to say, hey, I want to find out what's down there. Well, go ahead you won't come back to tell about it, all right? And then you have that great narrative with the sirens. You remember, there's a temptation. Odysseus has an opportunity to hear the song of the sirens, all right? Once again, it partakes of your theme of appearance and reality, all right? You know, you want to hear their beautiful song, but notice how they represent death, how they represent destruction. There, you, That's a great narrative. You remember Odysseus will be one who will be able to hear the song of the sirens and live to tell about it. Why? Because he has taken the necessary precautions you remember what he has told his crew to do to him as they're rowing toward the island of the sirens. Their song is so enchanting and so luring. And you remember they tied Odysseus to the mast of the ship and he's telling them to uh, release him, but they can't hear him because these wax has been put into their ears. All right, so that's great. So. In other words, there's a kind of curiosity there. But if you're curious 
And here I can say, I think you'll find this a little bit amusing. Uh, notice that we had Odysseus to understand the lesson of say no to drugs. Here, I always like to put it this way, humorously, take precautions when you go out and participate in certain behavior patterns. In other words, practice safe sex, that sort of thing. Now, that's part of it. That Don't let that curiosity overwhelm you and don't give in to the moment. Now, we'll call your attention to about line 375. This is, I will look at this passage a little bit. You remember what Odysseus has learned uh, in the Book of the Dead, what Tiresias says. So, you remember he has an opportunity to see the cattle of the sun god. All right, but you remember Tiresias says, you leave the cattle of the sun god alone. It doesn't belong to you. There's men are going to try to offer a justification and say, but we're hungry. All right. The way I explain this to you is you've got to, in a sense, show an abiding respect for the creation of the gods. In other words, look in terms of nature, for example. Look what we have to behold out there. Look at what God has given us to enjoy, all right? But we don't have the right to take advantage of it or to desecrate it or to ruin it. In other words, in a kind of modern sense, we don't have the right, I think, to go out and destroy, if you will, the rainforest. In other words, just because man is greedy and he wants the wood, the lumber out there to erect more houses, more buildings, that sort of thing. All right, look at what good the rainforest provides uh, for us. In other words, the rainforest through the herbs and uh, plants provide us some of the, my gosh, advances in terms of medicines. Probably rather necessary, don't you think, in terms of today. Now, so what Odysseus has got to do is to Learn the importance of abstinence. In other words, don't let your physical appetites get the best of you. In other words, don't commit one of the seven uh, deadly sins. Don't succumb, as we've talked about, pride. Don't succumb to gluttony. See? Be careful. Well, I think for all purposes, Odysseus has learned very well uh, in terms of this adventure. In other words, the gods are pleased with his performance here. All right, he has gone beyond simply knowing about the theory of death. What has happened to him now, he is, look, he's gaining a kind of grasp, if you will. He's, he now sees firsthand life is important. The living important. Now, uh, what's going to happen now is we conclude book 12, and what I want to do tomorrow, or Tuesday, uh, I want to talk about, uh, if you will, the third section. Now, we've gone through these three rites in my, in my last discussions. Remember, I talked to you about the right of separation. I talked to you about the right of transition, and now the last rite that he must participate in uh, so that he can become a fully recognized, important, functioning person. He has to participate in what I call the rite of incorporation. He's got to be received back into this society that he has left. All right. Now, in order for this to happen, I want this is an important point that I want to make, and we'll talk about some of what will happen in terms of these chapters. Some say that they're too long. They go from chapter 13 to 24. That's all right. We need that length because part of what's got to happen is Odysseus has got to learn truly what's going on, and how will he be able to fit back into this society 
that he has left. So two things must happen. He has got to be received back into this society through physical acceptance and recognition. And then the other thing that must happen is he's got to prove to these people that really for all purposes, he deserves to come back. And this means that he's got to perform some important task, some important feat. In other words, he's got to do something for them. Remember, he's been gone 20 years. So he is still, when he comes back, he's the wanderer. Remember, he, uh, he has learned the importance from Circe of useful deceit. He is disguised as, as this poor beggar, all right? And gradually, he will undergo a number of recognitions. So I conclude my lecture for today, and then I will finish the Odyssey with you in the next video. Uh, have a good afternoon.